She'd always dreamed of being a mother. So when she saw the two pink lines, she was thrilled. She felt her body changing, awed, and yes, sickened. She was sick with joy by how quickly her life was altered. She wondered, how long would it take to show? After 12 weeks, it felt like she could finally tell the world her good news. She bought her a onesie to celebrate. Green for good luck. They were excited for the 20-week anatomy scan. They'd finally learn the gender of their wee one. The silence of the technician gave way to fear. The baby had developed without life-sustaining organs. And then there was Teresa, who suddenly began bleeding. The hemorrhaging wouldn't stop, neither would her tears. She was inconsolable. Her partner held her hand, face white with fear. Her mom and dad rushed to the hospital. They had to decide what to do. It was a choice no one should have to make, but it was a necessary one. They chose her. Myra. Myra had her innocence ripped from her by someone that she should have been able to trust. Someone who should have cared for her, but instead violated her. And her little body just wasn't mature enough to bear the consequences of that betrayal. Kim didn't want to be a mother. She was tired of society telling her what she should do and why she hadn't done it by now. She didn't fit the mold. But they sure wanted her to, to force her to be someone she was not. And then there was Karen, who would have wanted to be a mother, but felt like everything was against her. She'd have to walk away from the dream of the career she was working towards. Without resources, her family couldn't help her. She was completely alone. And she knew it. She felt so helpless. She felt utterly helpless. She wished it was all different but she couldn't control the world. She could only control herself. And when Noelle heard the word ectopic, she clutched her midsection and let out a guttural cry. It wasn't true, it couldn't be true. The doctor said there was nothing else they could do. She could die. His words echoed in her ears, she could die. And it felt like she already had. Look, this wasn't the Mother's Day sermon I was anticipating preaching. This definitely isn't the Mother's Day sermon that I want to be preaching. But sometimes we have these come-to-Jesus moments in our lives, don't we? Where we're asked to be faithful, faithful even when we're not comfortable. I'd much prefer to give you all flowers and send you off to brunch with smiles on your faces. But the truth is, Mother's Day was never all that easy. No, of course we wish it were. It's easier to pretend it's sugary sweet, but the reality is that it is complicated. It is messy. It's not all pink carnations. In fact, sometimes those very flowers do the opposite of what was intended. Instead of feeling joy, they just magnify the pain, the alienation, or awkward feelings. Yes, this day is filled with so much emotion. Too many of us hurt on this day. Some so much that they don't dare come to church. And I get that. I understand. Some come pained, aching, because this day is just a reminder of what isn't, what couldn't be or never was. Some are hoping against bitter, sweet hope that maybe, maybe they will become a mother but the journey of infertility is brutal and there are no promises after breaking your bank or diving into debt others come missing their mothers those who have died in grief or some grieving what just never was we don't all have the perfect relationship with our moms Sometimes this day just reminds us of painful childhoods. It brings up feelings of abandonment or anger. Others grieve because they've outlived their child. The memory is so bittersweet. Grief, a constant companion, but all the more present on this day. And some never wanted to become a mother, alienated because they don't fit the model 
as though womanhood was defined by incubating babies. Yeah, <laughs> it's a hard day. And this week, it got all the harder. So as much as I'd like to share a sweet, feel-good sermon, we have to be faithful to our call and act as Christians who are not afraid to face the complicated and the uncomfortable. Because remember, Mother's Day at its core is, and certainly its inception was, always about women. It was about the power of women. Women who at the time could not vote. Women who were expected to stay home and do their jobs of keeping house and raising kids. But women who, despite the often disempowering situation that society put them in, had power. Mother's Day was a day to encourage women to claim their power, to use their voice, to make a stand. It wasn't nearly as domesticated as brunch, cards, and candy. It was pretty radical, actually. Let us not forget that Julia Ward Howe, the American abolitionist, the feminist, the poet, and the author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, proclaimed Mother's Day in 1870 as a call to women to use that power that was unique to them, to use their voices to call for disarmament, a call for peace. It was a rallying cry to women to use their power to transform the world. Celebrating Mother's Day, then, is celebrating women's agency and women's power in a time where they didn't have that power legally bestowed upon them, but claimed their power anyway. These women use their identities, yes, as mothers, and their uniquely female perspectives to effect change. As I reflect upon the leaked opinion that came out this week, I cannot help but think about the young women, the girls, my own daughter. Molly didn't understand what we were doing when we were protesting as we gathered at the county courthouse on Tuesday and marched to the federal building. As I explained it to her, I nearly choked up because this is not about babies. It is about agency. It's about autonomy. It's about power of oneself, one's body. To think that today I have power over my body and in a month's time suddenly won't. As a mother, I had a very difficult time explaining to my daughter that the government wants to take rights away from women. At its core, that is what this is about. As I've heard time and time again, if this were really about babies, we'd have excellent free maternal health care, as well as health care for all babies, regardless of documentation status. You wouldn't be charged a cent to give birth, no matter how complicated your delivery or how long you needed to stay in the hospital. If it was about babies, you'd have months and months of parental leave for everyone. If it was about babies, we'd have free lactation consultants, free diapers, free formula, free baby food. If it were about babies, we'd have free and excellent health care from newborns on. If it were about babies, well, we'd have universal preschool and pre-K and accessible child care before and after school. But this isn't about babies. This is about women. Women having power over their lives. Women having agency to choose what happens to their bodies. Even as I began the sermon with stories of women, their reasons aren't actually important. Because it doesn't matter what we think about their story, it's their story. And yet we cannot forget that every woman has her own story. So just in telling them, we give faces to these women. We seek to see them because women are not invisible. Our story is too shameful to be told. All week I've been thinking about Jesus, who saw the women that society sought to make invisible, or worse, who society sought to shame. The Jesus I know would not have thrown the stone. He would not have erased them. No, instead he saw them. He included them. He gave them a voice and a seat at the table. Oh, Christianity would try to erase that, try to put the shame back on women's shoulders. But let's be clear, that was not Jesus. I suppose this is what makes it all so infuriating for me, to see that our tradition is used to control and condemn I don't think that Jesus sought to control women. 
I think he came to empower all of us. Any who have been on the outskirts of society, who have been subjected by the powerful and the privileged. And yet the mere fact that this is driven by Christians who think that their version of Christianity is the purest, and thus deservedly their version of Christianity should rule the land, just flies in the face of our beloved American belief of separation of church and state. Look, if you think it's a sin to have an abortion, then don't have an abortion. What you believe and how you enact it in your own life, on your own body, is your personal belief. It's your own personal choice. But you don't have the right to impose that choice upon someone else. Personally choosing not to have an abortion is religious freedom. Making that choice for someone else on the basis of one's own religious principles is religious oppression. This is why the United Church of Christ has supported reproductive justice since the 1960s. And it is why we are not standing by idly now. We will not be oppressed by those who claim to share our faith, but who seek to oppress us with their religion in a land where we have been told that we are free. What's next? Gay marriage? We shudder to think how far this could go, knowing that already my trans siblings are being persecuted, women's autonomy threatened, and we can only imagine what horrors are in store. No, we cannot politely continue on with business as usual. This Mother's Day, I don't want brunch. I want justice. I want my daughter's life to be as valued as my son's, that she will have the same rights as he will. This mother's prayer is that my daughter might experience less sexism in her life than I've had to endure in mine, than her grandmothers have faced that their fight for justice will not be undone, that neither child will face harassment, and that each can make their own choices for their lives and for themselves. And not only do I want this for my children, I want this for everyone. Because let's face it, those who would be most disaffected, most harmed, most egregiously disempowered will be women of color. It will be those who live in poverty or do not have the privilege or means to easily cross borders. Yes, it always comes down to power and privilege. So let's get back to basics, to what this day is really all about. Women, our power, our call. Hear her calling to us from centuries past to light the fire among us yet again. Arise then, women of this day, arise. All women who have hearts, whether your baptism be that of water or of tears, say firmly, we will not have great questions decided by irrelevant agencies. Look, we've got a lot of work to do. This will not be easy. We Californians know that we will not be the hardest hit, but make no mistake, every woman is under attack. Anyone who believes in equality is under attack. Anyone who believes in religious freedom is under attack. So it's up to us to stand up and fight back. Let us find our courage and use our voices and know that God is with us when we are afraid, emboldening us, empowering us, calling out to us that we can speak out. We can fight, but we can also comfort, help, and heal. Join me on Saturday, this coming Saturday, 10 a.m. in Santa Ana, to make our presence known. But more importantly, let's join together to be church, to be sanctuary. Because if this goes the way it looks like it's heading, there will soon be those who feel helpless and hopeless. When they turn to look for help, we want to be there. Yes. We are called to be sanctuary. We, you and I, we will be instrumental in helping those most affected by these state bans and this personal repeal of freedom. And so, arise then. Arise. This is what Mother's Day is all about.
Rise up, sisters. Rise up. Amen.